I want you to turn your Bible tonight to Revelation chapter 12. I would like to finish this series on Israel, what next? And I want to conclude that. We suddenly broke into our series on the church at Antioch as a pattern or an example to us at LCC. And I still got a couple of messages after this after I've been in America, just want to come back and finish, conclude briefly that series on Antioch and maybe have one, maybe two more messages on that. But because of what happened in Israel, we immediately went into preaching on Israel from Scripture and given a context and showing what the Bible says in reference to Israel. But tonight, I want to finish this series as we look at Revelation chapter 12. Tonight, I'm going to take you to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, and finally, Revelation chapter 17. If you thought you're getting out before midnight, just think again. I want to tell you. We're going to start here with Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. My message tonight, part 14, the final message. But really, we could come right back into this at any point because in our world, in this hour, you do not know what happens next. These are extraordinary days, unusual days. And I think so many feel as soon as COVID kicked in 2020, so much changed in our world, in the thinking of men and women, in the thinking of many in the church. If you still think that these are normal days, or that you've gone back to business as normal, please think again. I want to tell you, there's much that's just about to happen in our world. Reading from Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with, su with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And then I just want to jump down. You should know this chapter pretty well. I'm assuming that. And that's maybe assuming far too much. But I don't want to deal with everything else. So let me just jump down to verse 8. Sorry, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and, by, and, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. And notice this next portion very carefully. Here tonight. And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, what does he do? He persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. Did you notice that it said there, the devil knows he's got a short time? So this time period, you can't make it into some 2,000 years. You can't do that. You can't make these days in the years. You can't do that. 
He said a short time, only a short time. Then listen, and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wrath with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together here. My message tonight, Israel and the new world order, or we could call it Israel and world government. Let's pray. Father, I do pray as we conclude this series, there's so much, very much left to say, but yet we conclude tonight, Lord God, on, on this vital subject of what's going to happen in the days ahead when a world government empowered by the person of Satan himself that will endure it, empower it, fill it, will literally raise up that world government with its economic military power and will advance against the small nation of Israel. Lord God, I pray, open up the scriptures that we can even discern in this hour, in this hour day, in this time. Lord God, the reality that everything is being set in place. Lord God, that we had realized that you had prophetic plans and purposes yet to be fulfilled mightily in the little nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And so the devil himself turns all his wrath and anger and vengeance and venom against that little nation because he realizes that you have a plan that you desire to fulfill. Lord God, I pray that Christ might be revealed here tonight in our very midst. You said the revelation of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And as we deal with prophecy, turn our hearts and our minds and our lives to the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Israel and the new world order, or Israel and world government, it says here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. The fact that it says a wonder shows it's a sign or a symbol. It's not a physical woman. And all the things to identify are not physical, literal, real. They're symbolic. They're signs. This is a vision there appeared a great wonder in heaven. It's a woman. But that is a vision depicting something. It's a spiritual vision. And it's got all the elements in this vision so you know what it represents, what it's depicting, what it's talking about. Because it's talking about an hour in future history, a time that you, that's datable, with certain events that are going to happen. And so to show you what's going to happen, we're given a vision. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. Notice it's not a small wonder. It's great. It's remarkable. It's unusual. It's notable. This woman you've got to take note of in the last days, she is one of the characters of Bible prophecy in the last days. Look how it describes her. A woman clothed with the sun. So we know it's not the literal sun. She is clothed with the sun. It's symbolic. And the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So we see the sun, the moon, and the stars are symbolic. It's not talking about the real cosmic sun, moon, and stars. We dealt with that previously in our previous message. And it says, she being with child, 
cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. When you look at chapters 12 to 14 in Revelation, it's one connected prophecy. In Revelation, you get certain segments of it that repeat, repeat, and repeat. You can't just read Revelation chronologically and think it's just flowing one thing after another. You'll get very confused. You won't understand Revelation. One of these days, we're going to get to expound in every chapter, setting it all in its right order, explaining it. But let me just say chapter 12 and 14 are a complete vision within the prophecy. And within these three chapters, we have some of the main characters who will stand center stage during what's called the Great Tribulation period. One of the most major characters is this woman. But who is she? She's a sign, a symbol. And literally the sun, moon, and stars identify who she is. She's not the church. She is not a thousand things that people try to make her. So who is she? Well, we know if we go back to Genesis 37, 9, remember we interpret scripture with scripture. How do you understand Revelation 12? You have to go back to Genesis chapter 13, sorry, chapter 37, verse 9. And talking about Joseph's dream, he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made abeyance unto me. In this dream of Joseph, his father Jacob is the sun. His mother Rachel is the moon. The eleven stars are his brothers. All of this. So in this dream, the sun, the moon, the stars depict the nation or the entirety of the people of Israel. That's what Joseph is seeing in his dream. Israel. When we come to Revelation chapter 12 and we see this vision of this woman, this unique woman that's going to play her part right at the end of Bible prophecy of history itself. Who is she? This remarkable woman. She is the nation of Israel. And the woman is the first and primary target of Satan at the very end. Do you see straight after seeing this great wonder in the heavens? Look at verse 3, what it says. Then, or, and there appeared another wonder in heaven. So you have the wonder of the woman. Then straight after that, you have the second thing. The wonder, a second wonder appeared in heaven. Right beside it, you've got this woman depicting Israel. Now, secondly, you have a second wonder. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And notice this, seven crowns upon his heads. That's a little indication telling you when it is. Or how to identify when this happens. So look again, you've got a second vision. The first vision is of the nation of Israel in the last days. The second vision is the great red dragon. In verse 9, it tells us who this great dragon is. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. Talking about the serpent that was in the Garden of Eden. That deceived Eve. This dragon... In Revelation, that we see a vision of that's going to come against Israel is the same dragon that was in the Garden of Eden. And lest we don't understand what he's saying, he, he describes more, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So look at the end of time and of history. At the beginning of time, you have the serpent, you have the devil, you have Satan deceiving Eve in the garden. At the end of time, you have this serpent appearing as a dragon. And it is the devil. And you know what? When you see him, what's he doing? He's not deceiving Eve now. He is now deceiving the whole world. What a mighty creature he is to hold such power. 
from one woman in a garden to almost eight or nine billion people in the world. Utterly remarkable. And it says, he was cast into the earth and his angels were cast with him. At a certain point at the end, and it hasn't happened yet, he gets cast down onto the earth. He loses his access to heaven to accuse the saints. He's no longer the accuser of the brethren. He is cast down onto the earth and he realizes his time is short. I believe this is shortly to happen, not far into history in the future. And yet look at how minuscule Israel is that Satan would pour all of his wrath. Here in Revelation 12, we are told that he goes against the woman. He attacks the woman. Out of the mouth of the serpent flows a river to carry her away with. When that doesn't work, what does he do? The serpent suddenly becomes the dragon and he goes against her to persecute her to attack her, to kill her. He goes with a military force and military power. When we think of what Israel is like tonight, you could fit the little bit of land called the state of Israel. You could fit it three times into Ireland. You could fit it inside our province of Munster and it would be lost but yet it has double the population of Ireland. It has over 9 million people tonight. It rests between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, 70 miles at its widest point, 30 or 40 miles at, 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 at its average um, breadth. And Jerusalem has a population exactly the same as Limerick City tonight, about 100,000 people. And yet when we go to the Bible, we see that all the wrath, all the venom, all the energy of Satan when he's cast onto the earth for a short period of time is focused on Israel and upon the little city of Jerusalem. That's utterly extraordinary. Do you realize the part that Jerusalem and Israel plays in world history is out of all size and imagination. She is not a normal nation. Jerusalem is not a normal city. And yet when you look at her, it's a non-entity. So what is it about this little city? What is it about this little bit of land, these mountains, these villages? What is it that the focus of the whole world is upon her? We're going to look briefly here. The last two messages have been on Israel or Jerusalem and Bible prophecy. And I want to conclude here looking at Israel and the new world order. Point one, Israel and world governments in ancient history and in Bible prophecy. Let me say that again. Just think about this a second. I want you to think tonight. Israel and world governments, these two things, Israel and world governments, in ancient history and in Bible prophecy. If I take you back to the Old Testament, to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, this is what it says. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, plural, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Do you know what God says about Nebuchadnezzar? He says he wasn't a normal king. He wasn't like other kings. He wasn't just like a great world leader. He was different than them. You know what God called him? He said he's a king of kings and even given dominion over the animals of the field. He's an utterly unique king. And when we come to Daniel chapter 2, we have God given Nebuchadnezzar dreams in the night that disturb his spirit. I'm not going to go into the full story. I just want to condense it so you understand it. The first 24 verses of Daniel chapter 2 is his dream. And listen carefully. The dream that God gives him, that Joseph interprets, sorry, that Daniel interprets, 
is the ABC of Bible prophecy. It's a key that unlocks world history. That dream and its interpretation is the key that unlocks all the Bible prophecy. If you don't understand it, you'll get confused in the rest of Daniel and in Revelation and in other scriptures. So you need to understand it very clearly. It's one of the most comprehensive dreams in the Bible, detailed with information and in its length and in its explanation. It is the backbone of Bible prophecy. And so how you approach Daniel 2 will affect how you understand prophecy all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation. If you don't get this, you can't get Revelation. It won't make any sense. And so that's the importance of it. We build here a little, there a little, line upon line. We interpret scripture with scripture. You don't go right into the book of Revelation and try and understand it. You, you will have dreams of the night if you try to go into Revelation and interpret it by your own intelligence and your own understanding. But what we see in Daniel and and in other books of the Bible, we see the rise of Nebuchadnezzar. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. God sent him against Jerusalem, against Israel, to take them captive. God did that. So we see God working with a wicked, sinful, pagan king and using him, sending him, using his military force against Israel to besiege Jerusalem, to conquer Jerusalem, and to carry the people into captivity. Daniel was one of them, a young man of royal descent. But God was using Nebuchadnezzar. If you think God only uses the church, you're greatly mistaken. Don't you know God is at work in the nations of the world? Oh yes, it's for his ultimate plan and glory. But if you think God cannot use secular leaders sinful leaders, atheistic leaders, you're gravely mistaken. You don't understand the mind of God. And so in this dream, you're, you actually see there is a statue depicting 10 kings, 10 kingdoms of four different kinds of metal. Let me give them to you. Number one, you've got the head of gold, which is Nebuchadnezzar. And that depicts the Babylonian empire, the first empire, the Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Notice the purity it starts with. You know why it's gold? He's a sinful man, but his government, his power is represented by gold. You know why? Because of its purity. Because it is very like God's dominion. Nebuchadnezzar didn't tolerate any opposition, neither does God. God doesn't tolerate rebellion, opinions, ideas. Well, I think God doesn't really care. You, you are a servant of God to submit. And so here you have God depicting the first kingdom. Then second of all, you have the breast and arms of silver. This was Cyrus the Great, and he ruled over the Medo-Persian Empire. They replaced Babylon. So this was the second empire that came on. First Babylon, then Medo-Persian. But you know what it's dealing with is government. Notice this, government. Nebuchadnezzar had a world government. Who did he conquer? Jerusalem, Israel, and he took them captive. Then who replaced them? It was, it was Cyrus the Great. And if you remember, it was Cyrus the Great who gave the command, sent the Jews back to Israel once again. And those Jews actually were given a commission by Cyrus, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. And he equipped them and sent them back. Do you see the part the world government plays in Israel? Here's a small nation, a small remnant. They don't even have a temple. And this great world leader, this great empire, God is using Cyrus the Great to actually fulfill his plan in Jerusalem. 
this small little devastated city. God is using the greatest world leader, the strongest government of the hour. Then again in the dream it says, his belly and his thigh and, sorry, his belly and thighs are of brass. That actually is Alexander the Great. And that was the Grecian Empire. Elsewhere in Daniel, it, it actually prophesies about the first king of Greece. We know he was Alexander the Great. And again, Alexander the Great marched his armies into Jerusalem. All three great leaders had a connection with Jerusalem. They are world emperors, world leaders with great power and great armies. Yet we have the history in connection with Jerusalem. Then fourth and lastly in this dream, his legs of iron. And also something will come to before the end of this, his feet, part of iron, part of clay, but that's not for now. Who was this, these legs of iron? Iron represents strength. This was the Roman Empire that replaced Greece. But these iron legs de depict its government type. Iron, strength, dominance. Who was that? I believe it was Augustus Caesar. Augustus Caesar is the first emperor or Caesar of Rome. And guess what? He gets named in our New Testament. It says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, this gospel opens with the reign of the first emperor, Caesar Augustus. He is the first emperor. It says this, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. He's a great world leader. What's he doing? He's sending out a command that's going to affect Joseph, Mary, baby Jesus, the nation of Israel. He's given commands. He's got power over Jerusalem, the population. Here's a young family with a baby and this great man, this leader of steel. This is what Daniel dreamed about. Do you know what's interesting about these four types of government? And it's not just depicting empires or kingdoms. It's depicting a certain kind of government. The metal depicts kinds of government. That's why it's different each time. It's a different style of government. It's all unique. It's all distinct. Notice that these four forms of government they succeed one another. They do not destroy totally the previous kingdom, but they conquer it. They absorb it into themselves. They integrate it, make it a part of themselves and incorporate it into their dominion and their rule. Notice as well, all in succession, one after the other, with no one else stepping in between. All of them in succession rule over Jerusalem which marks their prophetic rise. As soon as you see this connection with Jerusalem, and as soon as their kingdom touches the Mediterranean, they arise as the fulfillment of God's prophetic kingdom that he's talking about. And notice as well, it says over in Daniel chapter 7, it speaks about the same four kingdoms. But now it depicts them, not as a statue, but as four wild beasts. But I'll only deal with this fourth one. Listen to what it says. And this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was the diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Do you notice that in Daniel chapter two, it's got 10 toes. In Daniel chapter seven, what does it have? It's got 10 horns. Daniel actually depicts it 
not only in its past history, but at a time just before Jesus Christ returns to the earth again. What it looks like when Jesus comes or when a kingdom that's going to destroy all the earthly kingdoms comes again. It says in Daniel 7, 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Notice what it says about this fourth kingdom is different than the previous three. There is a distinction, something different about it. Something different happens with it. But we're going to look at that more. That's my first point. Israel and world governments in ancient history and Bible prophecy. Israel is intricately caught up with all of these great world governments, great world leaders, forms of government. You can't have a strong prophesied government to rule the whole world that doesn't have a connection with the little city of Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in history and within our Bible. This is my second point, the rebirth of Israel and world government in our contemporary history. I believe in the past 120 years, there's been two great attempts and there's about to be a third one to create a world government. I call this message Israel and the New World Order because that term New World Order, some people only take it back to George Bush and the Gulf War and Mikhail Gorbachev and the fall of Soviet Russia. And everyone gets excited and said, do you know Gorbachev spoke about the new world order? And George Bush said the invasion of Iraq was the new world order. And everyone gets excited and said, this is the new world order. Oh no, those people don't have a clue. That's way late in history. This term new world order not only goes back 120 years but goes right back to the French Revolution. It was out of the French Revolution that men, scholars, philosophers, secret societies coined the term New World Order. It was handed on to Karl Marx and communism that took over the entirety of Russia from the French Revolution to the Russian Revolution. There was an understanding of the new world order. It's not a new term. It's not a conspiracy theory. Do you realize all the great prime ministers and presidents and scholars? H.G. Wells wrote a, an entire book in the early 1930s. Guess what it was called? The new world order. It's not a new term. I've got books on my computer and my shelves. They are written from the early 1900s, written by pastors, written by theologians, written by politicians, and they write about the need for a new world order where we lose our democracy, where we yield up our individuality, and we have a federated world government, a one world ar army, a one world church. They talk about this. What is the new world order? It has been known for a long time in political circles. They have worked on this and they are working on it. So I want you to understand there's already been two attempts and they're planning to bring in the third attempt very shortly. They're working on it right now. What was the first attempt to bring in this new world order? It was right at the end of the first world war. And it took the shape of something that was called the League of Nations. In 1919, right at the end of the war, the Paris Peace Conference was held in France. The nations got together, 44 nations signed a peace covenant and birthed an organization called the League of Nations. Do you know sitting over that council, guess what they had? A council of 10 men. Very interesting. 10 men 
sat at Paris for several months and decided the destiny of nations. They carved up entire old historical empires that have been hundreds of years in place. These men decided the borders of nations. They birthed new nations, changed the entirety of the formation of nations. One of the men who sat there was the president of America, Woodrow Wilson. Do you know he was a militant man for world federation? He believed the world, we need to bring forth a government of world federation where all nations of the world are federated into one government. He was very outspoken on it. He was militant on it. Another man who was there was called Lord Milner. He overseen the 10 leaders. Who is Lord Milner? He was the prodigy of Cecil Rhodes of South Africa. You want to know who was behind the wars in South Africa, bloodshed, many atrocities in 1902. Do you know what? They practiced on South Africa what they intended to take worldwide globally. Lord Milner was one of the top most important politicians in Britain and almost nobody knows him today. He was a brilliant man, but he worked behind the scenes. Lord Milner, and I've looked at some of these letters, started writing letters to Lord Rothschild, one of the great bankers, a Jew, one of the great banking families of Europe. He had five sons, put them all in different countries, and in wars, they would finance the armies. One family, they'd become very rich. They're one of the richest families in the world today. And they've affected world history all through the 20th century into the 21st, a remarkable history. And so you had Lord Rothschild email, sorry, writing letters to Lord Milner back and forth two years before this peace conference. You know what they're talking about? Israel having its own land back, restoring Israel as a nation. Do you understand what I'm telling you? This is the first attempt at world government and the supreme men with most power and all the money are discussing and talking back and forth with the letter. Do you know what their plans, what they talked about later become? Was the Balfour Dec Declaration. Everyone calls it the Balfour Declaration. No, it wasn't. It was the Milner Declaration. They were writing about this and they give it to Balfour. You go do it. See, all the most important men, you don't even know their faces. You don't know their voices. You don't even know who they are or what they do. All the most important people in our world who you see, they, all they are are people being used. Like on a chessboard, but they're not the power behind it, I want to assure you. That was the first attempt and these men are talking in the creation of this when they create the league of nations you know what they wanted to do they wanted to be a body above all the nations and they would gain political influential financial power over the nations but it failed it didn't succeed and the two men who led the league of nations first both of them resigned and later turn up working on the united nations in very important positions. What I'm telling you is absolutely vital to understand in history. The second great attempt happened at the end of the Second World War. Do you notice how both attempts happened at the end of world wars? It was being planned through the First World War. For several years, we want a world government. When the Second World War broke out, 1939, 41 if you're an American, but 39 for the rest of us. But what happened right from the beginning of the war? There were plans to create another institution, an organization called the United Nations. 1945, at the end of the war, 50 nations got together and signed the charter of the United Nations and they birthed forth 1945. And they birthed forth 
this organization that today's got a lot of power over the nations of the world. It's utterly extraordinary. Just two years after its birth, the UN sits and takes a vote concerning given, concerning given independence to an Israel as a nation. They voted and desired that Jerusalem would be an international city for all nations, utterly unique on the face of the earth. And so Israel, this, this, it's called Resolution, Resolution 181, concerning a partition plan that Israel would get the land. They would have their own sovereign state, but so would the Palestinians or the Arabs. The Palestinians turned it down. The Arabs turned it down. But Israel, they stepped out and had, and had their nation. Do you know there was a map appeared in 1941 out of the American State Department. Notice the date, 1941, in the midst of the war. In 1941, in the State Department in America, it was riddled with globalists men who wanted a world government. This map appeared. Again, I've got my computer. It's a fascinating map, a remarkable map. It was a scholar in Ireland who discovered it in more recent times, made it public. But on this map, written into this map is President Roosevelt's post-war plans. As well listed on it are 41 proposals by an anonymous author, obviously someone more important than the American president. And listen to what that involved. The map portrays the end of imperialism with the federated United States of Europe. This is a map, 1941, at the early stage of war. This is what the world's going to look like after the war a united, federated Europe. Do you know who financed the creation of the EU at its beginning? A united Europe. Do you know who financed it? Four members of the CIA in America. All the money. The documents are open. This isn't closed secret of knowledge. It's an open realm. It's just no one tells you. But I like to know these things. I like to understand history. But on this map in 41, You've got a united Europe. Also, you have a new nation of Israel, which didn't exist in 39. Why in the midst of a war against Hitler in Europe are you depicting a nation of Israel on the map? And with several Eastern European nations united into the old Soviet Union, including Germany. Listen to me, in 1941, Germany had nothing to do with Soviet Russia. Why on this map do you have Germany, which had ended up being half of Germany? East Germany went in. How do they know that on this map? One, one, this great Irish scholar who studied this map, this is what he said. Either those men who drew up this map were prophets or they made it happen. And so the Second World War, at the end of it, you had the creation of the United Nations. Do you know at the time of its formation, they were also going to have a one world currency. They were working on this, a one world currency across the world. But when it got exposed, there was such a reaction. They compromised. Do you know what they created as a compromise? The World Bank. <clears throat> And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which gets every nation in the world in debt, especially in 2008, it suddenly grew to power. Do you know what's going to happen? Those organizations are going to bring us right back round to the third attempt at a world government. You see, even the Pope has said, and he's got a bit of influence and power, doesn't he? He has often said, several popes have said about the UN, it's got no teeth. 
Do you notice this beast, this iron beast? It says about its iron teeth. But the papacy over many generations have been saying, the problem with the UN, it's got no teeth, no power. The democratic nations, nationality, democracy, sovereignty, always hinders the power of the UN. That's why they're planning, looking for a remodification of the UN. I believe we're getting very, very close to that. Let me come back to Israel here, reference the UN at the minute. The UN General Assembly last year, 2023, passed 15 resolutions condemning Israel. Sorry, in 2022, passed 15 resolutions condemning Israel. But that same year, it passed only one concerning Iran, Syria, Myanmar, Crimea, Crimea, North Korea. Remember that country that was promising to nuke us all? Only one resolution against crazy North Korea that persecutes all of their population. One of the most vile nations. One resolution. How many against Israel? Fifteen. And also, only one resolution against Russia for its involvement with Ukraine. But 15 against Israel. This is the UN. As a political entity with legal power and an influence. Where's all its focus? Israel. That's where it's... Pro Why is it infatuated with Israel? Because that's what it is. It's utterly infa infatuated. But you know what? The Palestinian Authority wasn't once condemned, not once, or, or dealt with. In 2023, last year, a total of 15 resolutions were focused on Israel, but only seven on the rest of the world combined. And this, all of the states that make up the EU all aligned against Israel. You have something happening here. What I'm trying to show you is there's coming a political institution, a world global governmental system, and it's going to be against Israel. And we're fast getting towards it. Look at the UN at the minute. It's come out in your media about UNRWA, which is a department of the United Nations. It is the UN Relief Agency. It's meant to help for peace promote peace. It's meant to help those in need. It's come out and been exposed on our media that 12 of their aid workers were involved in the massacre last year. 12 of their workers. They as an organization dismissed nine of their workers as soon as this started coming public in recent times. But guess what? This has all been known for years. I've listened to videos way before this become public of men trying to warn the UN, the EU, and all the governments of the world that are financing this organization. It's also come public that 1,200 UNRWA workers are Hamas and Islamic jihad operators. There is only 1,300 workers but 1,200 of them are closely connected with jihad. 6,000 workers have close family members directly operating in Hamas. The Wall Street Journal, not that it's an authority, came out and said 10% of UNRWA workers are associated or affiliated directly with Hamas. Years of warnings have gone up, but nobody's listened to this. Do you know what UNRWA do within Israel? They actually create schools of education, training schools for children. They provide all the money. And guess where all of that money comes from? Taxpayers in Western nations. They provide school books, education, training. In UNRWA finance camps, children are trained in refugee camps. And guess what? It's dominated by Hamas workers. 
This organization has been funded by 20 major nations, 33 relief agencies. And the Palestinian curriculum books, I've seen a guy with the pictures explaining through this book. It's a children's book. Presently, in recent years, it's got pictures of terrorists. A certain woman who just a few years ago killed 33 people in a terrorist suicide attack, and she's depicted as a hero. Within these books, financed by the UN, they are taught not only to hate the Jew, but to kill the Jew. And they're trained on these camps. This is all UN financed. I just want you to get a picture. Third and finally, let me close. Israel and the last world government. You see, we're moving somewhere. And there's going to be a world government empowered by Satan. Do you think the UN's bad? Do you think the, the EU government that sits in Brussels is bad? Do you think all the legislations on morality and laws and abortion is bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Just wait till a government appears where Satan himself empowers it. And when that government gets empowered by the devil himself, by hell, it is going to turn all of its ferocity against a little nation. And no other nation will stand with Israel at that point, I want to tell you. It was a vote taken two days ago. Only America stood against it. The UN was making a stand against Israel, and only America stood against it. Britain didn't vote. Pretty typical. But listen, Israel and the last world government. Let me take you back to Daniel chapter 2. Remember we had that fourth kingdom, the legs of iron on this statue. But then we see something strange at the end of it. Listen, Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, 42. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay. Notice the feet and the toes. This is right before the fifth kingdom comes, one from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, a different heavenly spiritual government that's going to come down on the earth, that's going to cover the entire earth. What is world government going to look like just before Jesus comes back to take over the nations of the world? It's going to look like ten toes, the government, the form of government. When you see these ten toes arise, you know that you're at the end of world government. We're right at the end. So the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The legs were of iron. So that means what the Roman Empire was 2,000 years ago. There's something of that same kingdom, government, going to appear at the end again, or is going to exist at the end somehow. And it's going to be noted for its connection with Rome in past history. But look, there's a mixture. It's not just the iron of Rome. There's also the clay that is mixed with it. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with Mary clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom should be partly strong, partly broken. The iron represents strength. The clay represents brokenness or weakness. And yet it's intermingled on these feet, these toes, the ten toes. And so, finally, it says in verse 41, they are divided, two materials, two different kinds of government. A distinct change from the legs to the feet. The last world government, when it appears, is going to have a mixture of two forms of government. One like Rome. And I'm telling you, that was dominant. They didn't tolerate any uprising. It was military. It was strong. But this last government is a mixed government. It's not pure. It's a mixture. 
the government rule of the fourth kingdom of Rome is going to be subdivided into 10 just before God sets up his kingdom upon the earth. That's going to be a sign when this last government is going to take a 10 king form. That's how you're going to identify it. The last form of government of this empire will be fundamentally different from the Roman legs. The government that was led by Augustus and the imperial emperors will have some similarity to this, but it's going to be distinct. This is going to be ten kings. The feet and the toes made of iron and clay represent a mixture of strength and weakness or tyranny and democracy. That's what I believe it represents. These ten kings try to forge a united government by merging two very different types of government. They try to force it together, but it doesn't work. This is the day we live in. They're preparing to try and forge two very different kinds of government together and then rule the world. This is what it's going to be like. These ten kings only arise at the end of the rule of the kingdom. They are a sign that it has reached its end, that Jesus is coming again. So we have these two forms of government merged in the feet. We are told twice that the iron and clay is mixed together, meaning to co-mingle or to intermix. Although they will try and merge, yet they are distinct. They can never mix. They can never become one. But they are held together under these ten kings. It's an artificial, abnormal creation of unity. It's a unity, but they can't be unified. They hold together, but they do not mix without measure. They're also, we are also told that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. There's a lot of strange teachings around this first. People go off into saying all, all sorts of things about DNA, um, uh, uh, about AI, and they, they teach strange things from this verse about mingling with the seed of men. They say the Nephilim, the angels are coming again from this verse. They said this is all about angels coming down and mixing with It's got nothing to do with that. It's government. It's got nothing to do with Genesis 6. This is all about a type of government. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Clay is the symbol of man. Man's government. Democracy. Man deciding, not of a tyrant or a Nebuchadnezzar or a Caesar, but what you have is man's kind of government. I think, I believe, why don't we do this? No wonder it can't hold together. Imagine trying to join China with your average Western democ uh, democracy. Just look at the UN at present, when all the great leaders of the UN, look at all the Arab nations there, the Muslim nations that want jihad, and then the liberal nations that are all into LGBT, and they're all sitting in a political building, taking votes about how to order the world. Since we're getting very close to something very interesting happening, in our world. Then over in Daniel 7, something more happens about this fourth kingdom that we begin to see. What does it say in Daniel 7 about the fourth kingdom or the fourth beast? In verse 8, or sorry, verse 7, it says, and it had 10 horns. That fourth beast has 10 horns. That beast of iron has 10 horns. In verse 8, Daniel 7 verse 8, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. When you see the ten toes or the ten horns, that marks the last government. But notice a strange thing. What are the ten horns? Ten horns are ten kings. The same is true in Revelation of the very same beast. It has ten horns as well in Revelation. But it says here, a little horn comes up amongst the ten. What are the ten? They're kings. 
What's the little horn? He's a king. He's a man. He's a leader. He's a governmental leader. So you have a world government at the end that's going to rise, a mixture of clay and iron. The last world government, when it first appears, it's got 10 kings. But up from the midst of it comes this little horn, a man, an insignificant politician, an insignificant national world leader. These are global rulers. This little man begins to arise right in their midst. He's part of their system, but he's utterly unique. Then it says in Daniel 7 verse 8, the little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn were like eyes of a man and a mouse speaking great things. It says in verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and shall break it in pieces. Verse 7, and it had 10 horns. It's still the fourth beast, but it has 10 horns. Revelation chapter 13, this beast that you see, the same beast, has 10 horns. But in Revelation 13, the 10 horns are crowned. Do you know what it means when it's crowned? It means that's when it comes to power. In Revelation 13, you're seeing the iron beast when it comes to power. Ten kings with crowns on their head. They're reigning with power. So it shows this iron beast at a time where it's got ten kings. Do you know Rome never had ten kings? This prophecy has never been fulfilled as yet. In the time of the Roman emperors after Augustus, they never set up. It was one emperor. One emperor. Always one tyrant, one leader. Whether he was an Augustus or some other, Julius Caesar, whatever. You, you had tyrants. You didn't have 10 men working globally together. But this talking about this iron beast in the book of Revelation. It says in Daniel 7, 24, and the 10 horns out of the kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. They're going to arise at some point. They're not always on the beast. They're not always functioning. But it's a part, that system, at some point, you're going to get 10 kings arise out of it. The beast does not always have 10 kings. It's a point in its future history almost right at the end. He says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them a little horn, an insignificant player. He uproots three and we never hear about the other seven again. Do you know what I believe it is? Ten regions of the earth. One of them is Europe. Some years ago, Gary Ka was visiting our local church in Scotland. And there he was holding the United Nations Charter. And he showed a map. And I went up afterwards and said, can I see that? And he showed me the UN print on it, the United Nations print. And he opened it up. And there was a map of the entire world split into 10 regions. The United Nations. This is their plan for the world. And the Bible talks about it. World government. 10 kings. 10 regions. Nowhere in prophecies does it say 10 nations. Nowhere. All the Bible teachers say 10 nations. They made it 10 European nations. Then the EU got too big and they couldn't say that anymore. And said, we, we think it's going to decrease down to 10 again. A load of rubbish. It's going to be 10 world regions. It's going to be a world government. That's how you're going to identify. It's an extraordinary prophecy. And the 10 horns that were in his head and of the other which came up before him, three fell. When you go to Revelation chapter 13, sorry, let me go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, where we started tonight, and I'm going to close. Revelation 12, verse 3. Remember the visions? Remember where we started? Gives a time period of three and a half years. 
when you see this world government turn its venom on Israel, three and a half years of persecution, tribulation of assault on Jerusalem. It's going to besiege Jerusalem three and a half years. The tribulation begins with all the armies of the world besieging Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the tribulation ends with them surrounding Jerusalem. It lasts for a period of three and a half years. In Revelation 12 and 3, it says, A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. It's the same beast. Then in chapter 13, verse 1, And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. It's the same beast. And upon his horns, ten crowns. So look at the vision. This is when the ten kings get power. And upon his head's the name of blasphemy. In Revelation 13 and 1, we are told that he saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads. And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. Remember all the Bible teachers who say the Antichrist is going to get shot and get resurrected from the dead? The head isn't a man. The horns are ten kings. What are the heads? It actually says it's got seven heads. One of the heads gets killed or wounded looking like it's dead. So something is happening here. You're learning something. I just want this to sink in, some of this. It says one of the heads, one of the seven heads, was wounded to death. It means to slaughter, to butcher to death. I believe I know which of the seven heads it was. I believe it was the sixth head. Do you know why? The seven heads represent forms of government here. And it's all on the same beast. Which beast? The Roman beast. All the Bible teachers out there, okay, they're going to tell you these seven heads are seven empires. And one of those seven heads is Rome. How can Rome be the beast? How can Rome have a Seven heads that are seven different empires, and one of its head is itself. That's confusion. That's not right. Do you know what it's talking about? Seven kinds of headship on the Roman beast. Seven kinds of government on this one beast. And John is talking about it. Do you know when, when he starts talking about these heads, it's very interesting in chapter 13, chapter 7. And he said, five of these have come and gone. And one is. And one is yet to come, the seventh. Listen to that again. He said in John's day when he wrote this 2,000 years ago, he said seven of the heads on the Roman beast, five of them are gone. They've come and gone. In other words, they rose and fell. The word's different than slaughter. Five of them, they've just risen and fallen. But that sixth one, in his day, because the seventh comes in the last days, so it has to be the sixth. He says the sixth head was slaughtered to death. It was killed. It's not the Antichrist being shot and then raised from the dead. It was an entire form of government in John's day. What was that form of government? Imperial Romanism. Do you know when you go back to the history books, and I don't have the quote here, there were five previous forms of Roman government. Imperial Rome was the sixth form of government on this Roman beast. And that sixth head, the head was slaughtered to death. And when the Roman Empire fell, the sixth head was slaughtered by pagan tribes invading. And it's lay dormant. But do you know what happens? It says in this prophecy, you're going to see the head healed again. The wounded head is going to be healed. 
and then the ten horns are crowned. Do you know what the sixth form of government looks like? Ten kings. When the Roman beast gets healed again, resurrected again, raised from the dead again, it's the raising up of a form of government. It's going to have ten kings ruling it. It's the seventh head. But you know, in Revelation says something interesting. Out of these ten kings, which are the seventh head, there's an eighth. How, how can you have seven heads, but there's an eighth? Who's the eighth one? It's the little horn. The ten leaders become one man called the little horn, the Antichrist, the man of sin. Saints of God, boy, I'm barely touching on this. But you know what I'm telling you? We're getting very close to a certain point in time in prophetic history. And when you first say, Revelation chapter 7 in time sequence comes before Revelation chapter 13. So when you see this Roman government begin to arise, you need to look to Revelation 17 to identify her. What does she look like? When you see this Roman beast, when you first catch glimpse on her, who's riding on her back? The scarlet woman. There's a woman who is the city of Rome. She's mystery Babylon. She's an idolatrous system that has put idolatry in the entire world. She's guilty of the blood of martyrs. She is drunk with having killed real born-again Christians. And she's riding. When you see this beast begin to arise, and the ten kings haven't been crowned yet, but this woman is riding on the back. And she sits on seven hills. It's the city of Rome. Seven hills. She's a mystery religious system that has a long history. You're seeing her right at the end. Because those ten kings, when they get power, they destroy her. That's what the Bible says. So you're seeing her right at the end. And right at the end of her history, before she's destroyed, you see this political system come. And when you see it arise, you're going to see a woman right in the back. The Roman Catholic Church. Remember when that seventh, sorry, the sixth head got slaughtered. Who took over Rome after imperial Romanism? Who moved into the city of Rome and took up all the titles and took on all the garments and took on reigning over the nations? The papacy and the Catholic Church. So from the sixth head through to the seventh head, you've got the Catholic Church in Rome. And let me make a prediction. These 10 kings are going to be crowned and come to power in connection with the city of Rome. And when they get power, they'll destroy the Catholic Church. And then they'll turn and begin to prepare as a political system for the rise of Antichrist. Since I believe we're in the last days, and all we've covered about Israel I'm telling you, the Bible talks time and time again about a little horn, the king of the north, this man of sin who's going to rise up and come and invade the land of Israel and assault her one last time in history and pour out all the venom of the nations. And the UN is just preparing towards that end yet. As we close this entire series, can I ask you something in closing? And I mean this with intensity and sincerity and depth. If you really believe that all that we're seeing in our world, the technology that is being formed, the nations being set in place, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Israel, America, Europe, the EU, the UN, everything being set in its place, and that Jesus is coming again, and that this book is real, it's true, that the end is near, 
All of this is true. Everything written about Jesus, all the prophecies are coming to pass. Where are you spiritually tonight? And what are you going to do for the Lord Jesus Christ in this last bit of time? You may say, Israel's insignificant or nothing, and you're less insignificant or nothing. And yet we're to play our part in the last hours of history. Where's your heart here tonight? Are you on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you burning for him tonight? Are you in prayer tonight? Is your cup full and overflowing? Is your lamp trimmed and ready? Do you have oil in your lamp tonight? Are are you a bright and a shining light? Is your heart pure tonight? Are your hands clean tonight? Is Christ consuming you tonight? Are you in love with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you allowing anything between you and your Savior? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready for death should it come tonight? If you are snatched away tonight, are you ready to meet him? Is there things you don't have in place? Are you saying, oh, I've got years yet? I've got lots of time. What if you're snatched away tonight? What if this was the hour and the time? Is your soul ready? Because, saints, I want to tell you, the spirit of prophecy is the revelation of Christ. And we're looking at all these things, but I want to turn it to you. What about the revelation of Christ, the person seeing him in his glory? Are you filled with love? Love is the mark of a real Christian. You will know them by their love one for the other. That's the mark of a genuine Christian. If you don't have that, you're not a Christian. You're not a disciple. Is your love burning for your brother, your sister? You shall know them. And some years ago in this city, I spoke to sinners who were visitors in the meeting. I said, you know, you might have had a nice handshake coming in the door. And all the Christians will go and say, good to see you and welcome to the meeting. But I says, don't judge this church by that. Stick around. Watch the Christians. And if they love one another, you know it's safe to be here. By their love, one for another. Because you can't counterfeit that. You can't create that. That is the mark of regeneration, of the new birth, of the power of the Holy Spirit that you love one another, a gappy love. And I want to tell you, like I've been warned over these weeks, a gappy love is under attack in this hour and generation. The devil is after your love. And this isn't human love or natural love or fraternal love or uh, maternal love. Do you know what it is? It's super natural love that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Father, I pray for everyone online, everyone here. Father, we we can have great debates, great conversations, many questions about Israel and prophecy and world government. But really, at the end of the day, only one thing matters right here in this meeting tonight. Lord God, it's our heart before you. It's our hands before you. It's our relationship, our walk before you. Lord God, will you search us? Will you come with a new, fresh breathing upon this church and this people again? Will you come and pour out your Holy Spirit? Will you revive us in this last hour? Lord God, that our lamps might be trimmed and ready. Lord God, there be a deep searching of hearts in these days. There be a deep dealing with you, our God. Lord God, I don't care about religion. I don't care about churchianity. I don't care about all of these things. But oh God, we care about our walk with you. Lord God, we want to be in earnest tonight. Lord God, that we'd have a visitation of the power of your Holy Spirit. That we'd have a fresh encounter with the man of Calvary. That we had literally experienced not a theological dead cleansing in the blood, but Lord God, a vital, real purging and washing in the precious blood of the Lamb. Lord God, that we'd know that life-given flow. Lord God, 
cleanse and move and work and breathe them within us. Oh God, breathe into this body that there might be an earnest seeking after you, a laying a hold of you, oh God, that there be a drawn out of our hearts tonight. Oh God, let the power of God fall tonight. Oh God, come with fire in this hour. Come in this man, oh God. Oh God, you know my heart. You know my desire. I desire you, living God. Come with that sacred flame. Lord God, come with that pure revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray, Lord God, that you'd bring us each individual in the mighty name of Jesus to a fresh consecration, a fresh, a fresh breaking, a fresh visitation, a fresh outpouring, a fresh humbling of ourselves, a rending of our hearts and not of our outward garments. Lord God, we thank you for the word of God that every prophecy, every promise, every teaching, every instruction, every revelation, every insight is to bring us into a deeper walk with you. And Lord God, we dare not take one scripture from this book and use it without at first making our hearts to burn with a holy sacred flame. Lord God, we're asking of you, fill us anew with the power of your Holy Spirit that we might glorify you in these last days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.